Hello, guys and gal. Thank you for joining us on this Thursday. Thursday, I had, had a minute. Uh, why don't we start by each of you saying how you got your start in the business and what your position is today? My name is Paul Finsale, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of MyYet. Um, I am a human rights lawyer by training. I served as the executive secretary of South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, so it's a kind of unlikely path from that to the world of luxury fashion. Um, but I think one of the reasons why we set up MyYet was based on a conviction that driving dignity to people at the bottom of the economic pyramid is done by giving them work and not handouts, and that there is this real treasure of artisanal skills um, in developing economies around the world, whether it's hand-woven silks or block printing or hand-poured uh, jewelry. And that is a treasure that the world needs to see and appreciate, but also a source of enormous value to the artisans who make it, providing it is branded and shepherded and designed in a way that is covetable and desirable um, for people who, who have the means to acquire them. And for anyone who has ever set foot in the Mayette Boutique in Soho, let me just assure you that it is very covetable and desirable. That's very kind. <laughs> the last time I walked in, I walked out with a bucket bag. So it was, uh, and I had to be restrained from buying shoes. Don't be restrained in the future. No, no, I had to, I had to have a talk with myself. Like, a <laughs> come to, you know, like, you must stop. Please. Hi, my name is Jennifer Zuccarini. Uh, I'm the founder of Fleur du Mal. Am I talking too close to this? Um, and I, um, I moved to New York about 15 years ago, and I studied um, fashion design at FIT. I'm from Canada originally. Um, and I was always very passionate about lingerie and intimate apparel. Um, I co-founded a company called Kiki de Montparnasse about 10 years ago. Uh, and it was really the first luxury brand surrounding intimacy and creating a space where women and people could feel comfortable to buy things to enhance their intimate life um, and, and have it feel like a very luxurious, um, beautiful experience. And four years ago, I started my new brand. Um, and I was very inspired to create something um, that would you know, make, make women feel powerful, but also able to embrace their femininity. Um, so yeah. And Kiki de Montparnasse, oh. <laughs> and you, sir? My name is Kenneth Richard. I'm the um, founder, editor-in-chief, and creative director of something called The Impression, um, which is a, a new digital media company. We uh, cover the sport of fashion marketing. We have TV, uh, print, uh, about 12 issues a year, as well as daily online news coverage. Um, I got my start as a designer. I was a ready-to-wear designer mounting about 36 runway shows in the 90s. Um, saw the birth of uh, 7th on 6th and all the runway shows that happened here in New York at a store in Soho and a showroom in Paris. And then I left that when my first daughter was born. I realized I needed to actually buy diapers and uh, started uh, my path in marketing, which has predominantly been marketing and branding and then helping organizations, you know, tell better narratives. And actually, going back to what you said, since you are a Fashion Week veteran, how do you, with Fashion Week coming up in September, God help us all, again, uh, how do you think it's changed over the years? It's gotten bigger. Um, you know, the return on investment for fashion shows is, is dramatic because traditionally about 15 years ago that budget was allocated to just relatively the people in the room. But today you take a look at a brand like Tommy Hilfiger and it's a spectacle that, you know, touches, you know, a billion impressions. And that's a lot of impressions. So the budgets have gotten bigger, you know, the scale of the production, the sets, the narrative storytelling around it has gotten a lot bigger between the backstage and, and the social bloggers really sitting as part of the staging. So shows aren't going away anytime soon and they're only getting, you know, bigger and, and the weeks are longer. What about for smaller designers? Is there 
an imperative to put on shows or is it just money down the drain? No, I think it's just the opposite. I think it's probably still the best return on investment. I think a young designer can drop, you know, as low as 20K, you know, um, negotiate. The average is around 50, right, to put on? I think that's a low average. Low average, okay. Yeah, I'd say that average would be about 150, be my guess, but it's speculative. Yeah, but I think it's great. And with you, I wanted to ask, I feel like your, your company does so much in terms of, I guess, what we call ethical fashion. Do you think that that has become a major imperative also for companies? I mean, do people, are people paying more attention to sourcing and how clothes are made and disposable clothing? I mean, I think the facts are just unavoidable. There's just a, just a ream of data which says that as each generation matures, uh, and increasingly amongst people who have already matured and are kind of traditional luxury shoppers, provenance, sourcing, ethics um, mean a great deal. Um, and I think if you just look around the world today, there are, it's a challenged and complicated world, and I think people want brands to be able to stand for something and live up to a set of values and ideals. I think it's at the same time really important not to confuse ethical sourcing and trying to do good in the world with making beautiful products. Um, and I always sort of use the analogy, if you were kind of starting a yogurt brand and you were going to source it from carefully sourced non-antibiotic milk, single farmer farms in Vermont and everything was done perfectly and the yogurt tasted terrible, it, there would be no point in doing it, it wouldn't be a sustainable business and it would fail. Um, and so I think the challenge in our space is to do good, um, but to do good in a way where the mission and the aesthetics and the desirability are all aligned uh, and not to use one as a substitute for the other. But people are definitely, and by people I mean consumers, are definitely paying attention. It's, you know, it, there is, Every single year, you have more people who are interested. And they're interested not just because you're giving people the dignity of work and not just because you're um, trying to kind of uh, drive wealth to people at the bottom of a pyramid. They're also interested because there's a story. And I think we as humans love stories. So if something's mass produced in a large factory uh, and is a commodity, that is less interesting than being able to say, this is fair trade Mongolian cashmere, uh, it's spun in the finest mill in Italy, it's cradle to cradle certified, it gives herders, nomadic herders, um, a much, much better life, but it's also spun in a mill that makes the finest cashmere in the world and we've invested to try and get that certified. And then you have a sense that when you wear it, it's both desirable and you look great when you're out, but it's also something that you can tell a story around. And, that's who we are as people. And it makes you feel better as a person, right? Absolutely. Which we love. And speaking of feeling better, how do you think women relate to lingerie today? I think now more than ever, lingerie's really become um, a part of fashion. And the last couple of years, women showing their lingerie has become you know, much more acceptable. and. I, I really love to think about it as a part of a woman's wardrobe and not something that you're just hiding underneath, but it's, you know, it's the first thing you put on. It, um, you know, hopefully when you put on something that fits you well and, and is beautiful, it's making you feel more confident and, and better um, with everything else uh, after that. Um, but I think uh, women, I think it's changed a lot. I mean, I think the way women are, you know, used to be all about push-up bras and what I think a Victoria's Secret sort of sexiness, and I think that's that's really changed because there are so many brands um, out there now, and I think you can find your your niche and your um, whatever aesthetic you want. There's something there's something for that. How do celebrities wear those crazy dresses on the red carpet <laughs> and don't pop out? Um, I think it's a lot of tape, and. Um, yeah, a lot of double stick tape, silicone. There's a lot of like silicone, as I'm sure women in the audience know about, um, stick on cups and things that help you maneuver in outfits like that. But you mean like, but <laughs> how do they wear like those little string dresses and like their boobs don't move? I think they're just, well, 
I think are they bionic to, to start with? <laughs> I think to start with, their bodies are probably pretty tight and happening. You know, they're not moving around so much anyway. Um, but I think you know, you have someone, a stylist working with you, they're fitting everything to you perfectly, they're like sewing it to your exact measurements, then you're double stick taped in there. And then I think you're aware, I think you're you know, holding yourself in a way where hopefully you're not having a wardrobe malfunction. Yeah, this is, these are one of the burning questions I always have. Yeah. Like you see these red carpet pictures and you're like, oh my God, how did you get out of the car without like, what, you know? <laughs> if the wind blew the wrong way, how? <laughs> on a more serious note, how did each of you establish your fashion identity in terms of building your brand? I think, you know, establishing a fashion identity is so important, especially now because there are so many brands and, you know, it used to be that you launched a brand and you had to have retailers get on board and editors and, and now I think there are so many brands that just are able to do that through social media. So having that a strong identity is so important. And I think sometimes that's the aesthetic and, and DNA of a designer. And other times it's, you know, it's creating who that is in the brand. And, and I like to think of it as like creating a person and, you know, who is that, who is that woman? What does she do? Where does she go? What art does she look at? Um, what music does she listen to? And, and I think it's, it's so important for designers to, to have a strong identity because there's just so much out there. Like, it, it, it has to cut through. I mean, <clears throat> I'm a great believer in women and our company's... So am I. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's easy to believe in women given their competence. Um, but, uh, you know, 90% of our company is women and I think we live in an age in which women are not just objects, they're subjects, and they are smart, and they're accomplished, and they're curious, and they traveled, and they bridge the, the divide between a private life and a professional life. And I think we wanted to build a brand that meant something to that kind of woman. Um, and, and I think that that, you know, as gender and gender rights become more prevalent in the world, and as equality becomes more important in the world, I think you have to have a brand that takes women seriously and that engages with women um, in all their multifaceted capacities. And so I think that was something that we believed in right from the very beginning. Mm. We're 23 months old. Um, we're still building a brand. But when I hear that question as I kind of apply it to fashion, I think of building an alphabet. So the truth of the matter is, is that every brand has a language, a very specific alphabet. So you take Chanel, for instance. Chanel has a wonderful alphabet. It's probably the broadest alphabet of any brand out there. They have the heritage of the carnation, a particular top hat, a type of pearl, the boucle, the, the Tweety Edge. You have an iconic logo in your F. You know, you have heritage in the types of metals even that you use. So there's this alphabet and language that every design house or every brand has to sort of define. You know, what is the language that I'm going to use at every touch point to communicate, be it, you know, my visual messaging out there or be it just the development of my product. And I think the best branders just build the largest alphabets to work with. So in recent times, that would likely be Tori Birch. She's probably got the best language from, you know, the monogram to the orange lacquer fixtures to the brass handles. So the door handles, her store. So anyway, the, uh, I think building an, a language that you can point to and use to communicate for a long time is probably the, the number one step to building a brand. How important, and, I, and this is something um, that you touched on earlier, it, it used to be that you had to have the support of major fashion editors in order to be viable. And I feel like now, I mean, you look at Kylie Jenner and her lip kits, and it's a phenomenon. She, do, doesn't, she does no press for them. She doesn't advertise. She doesn't sit down with editors. She doesn't do the rounds. And people go crazy. And I know that, you know, I, I felt this kind of, it's kind of dumb, but I read about Ryan Roche, who does this, you know, she does her the sweaters, and they're amazing. And I didn't read about him in a magazine. Someone mentioned her on Twitter. Like, a friend mentioned, said, like, congratulations, you're in the CFDA. And I was like, oh, I wonder who that is. And I looked her up, and I was like, holy shit, like, these are incredible. 
and I got some. Do you feel that that's changed? That now people want to have, they want to discover things on their own? I think so much because it, it's still so important, I think, to have to engage the fashion industry and it feels so great to have editors mm -hmm. loving your brand, but I think now you can, you can build an audience on social media, a very devoted following that, that if, you can, if you're creating a lifestyle that they wanna buy into, then you can be successful that way. And it, it, there are so many brands that I'll, we'll discover a brand and say, I've never heard of this, I've never seen it at retail or in a magazine, but people love it and, they're, and they have that following. So I think that's, that's changed everything. I mean, I think editors will, are and will always be important, but I think the shift that's happened in recent years is that in some ways customers have become editors. Um, and you know, the best customer is, can be your best editor, they can be your best spokesperson, they can be your best curator, they can be your best route to market and you ignore those customers at your peril. Um, and I think there's something amazingly democratic and open about that, and it means that the barriers to entry in fashion are, are lower, um, and it means that if you have a story to tell, it can have a virality to it that, uh, that you wouldn't otherwise have in a, in a prior era. And I wanted to ask you, just because I'm a huge fan of the brand too, how did you guys develop your partnership with Tata Harper? And for those of you who don't know, she makes the greatest skincare on the planet. Uh, it, it's all out of her farm in Vermont, and the stuff is like, just, it's all, like you read the ingredients and you actually know what they are. Yeah. I mean, it's partly because we love to work with great value aligns brand, brands and also just lovely people, and she is just a, a wonderful person and her full team and her husband, are just, they're just an amazing couple and an amazing company. Um, and so increasingly what we've been doing is regarding the, the kind of exercise of brand building not as a sort of zero-sum competitive space, but really thinking of it as how you build collaboration. Um, and we just uh, did an event in our store last, last week or the week before called Maison de Mode. Um, and just a, a fantastic group of people harnessing together a set of other ethical brands and we hosted a fantastic event in our store and 100 people came and we gave an opportunity for other brands to be showcased and to be sold. Um, and I think the more you build a community of like-minded brands, the more you know, rising tide lifts all boats. Um, and I think if you think about life in terms of collaboration rather than competition, it, it, it often comes back to you. Um, it's the right thing to do and it also just benefits you. So. And how important is celebrity? And I mean, real celebrity as opposed to people who are paid to wear clothes. Because I think at this point, audiences are savvy enough to know the difference. It's funny because I think the, the right celebrity, if it's someone that really matches the aesthetic of your brand, and, and we like to work with people that are, that are passionate about what we're doing and they, they love they want to wear the clothes, they want to wear our, our product. Um, and then it sort of happens organically. But it's funny because sometimes we'll have celebrities wear our, our product and not post about it because they're not being paid to do so. So it kind of is a funny thing where, you know, you have these, these authentic things happening where celebrities are engaging with your product, but they're not sharing it because they're not being paid to, do, <laughs> to share it. Um, but I think when you get the right celebrity, it's, I think it does, every little bit helps. I feel like just people need to see your brand enough and, and see it with, aligned with the right people. Have you guys had a moment where you see something, a picture somewhere or on Instagram or wherever, and you're like, oh my God, so-and-so had my thing on and I didn't even know. Totally, all the time. It's, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful moment, and, but, and I think also, but I think the key to that is if it happens spontaneously and authentically, uh, that's what you want. That you want people with real profile who love your stuff and wear it and are proud to kind of talk about it. What was your most mind-blowing moment? I mean, I'm a massive fan of Emma Watson. Um, and I think she is thoughtful and articulate and smart and embodies a kind of, you know, woman that you, you know, you hope your daughter will grow up to be like and, and who is just has a kind of 
longevity to her and a sense of smarts. And she has been a fan of, of Mayette. She's a fan of a bunch of other brands as well. But I think that sense that she, she loved it and uh, was wearing it was just, uh, w was, was, was just amazing. And you do get the sense with her that she does her homework and she, she buys intelligently and yeah. Yeah, and on the other That's extreme, like Kate Blanchett loved our jewelry and was, was wearing it. And I also think she's just thoughtful and smart and rocks it. And so she's a kind of, you know, she's an iconic kind of fantastic woman. And from your perspective, does celebrity carry the same weight? Um, no. <laughs> um, you know, I see celebrities now as a, an avenue of communication. So I think that what we're seeing now is that brands aren't spending on media. And what they're doing instead is in their production costs, they're building in a relationship with a celebrity um, that is both in their physical campaign that they can run multiple ways, as well as in having that person's expanded network. So that network of all of their followers are as much as most magazines. Uh, distribution. So um, I, th I see celebrity as, as ultimately in important, but also just a tool, you know. Um, but organically, I mean, I think it really helps for nascent designers or designers who aren't paying, you know, to be picked up over and over again, whether it's Kate Moss wearing those hunter boots to that festival and suddenly Glass the next thing, a right. years ago before the hunter was anything. Right. And suddenly it, it's, it, it can be indicative and start trends. Um, particularly in that particular case, which was truly organic. Um, but uh, I just think it's a tool, it's just a part of the game. And I do think that audiences are much smarter where they know that if someone's being paid and suddenly they're out there saying, this is the greatest lipstick of all, of all time, it's like, okay, you know? As opposed to I Kate Blanchett, you know, buying your jewelry or someone, get, or whatever, for whatever reason, she's obviously not in your ad campaign. Right. You're obviously not paying her, and she loves it. And that carries more weight, I think, because it came from her as opposed to a bank account. Exactly. And I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wrap. The audience, please. Hey, everyone. This is such a good panel, and I would live in the Madison Tory Burch store if I could. Um, I know a lot of smart people who do not want to hear about the ethics of fashion and do not know the difference between bloggers and celebrities. So I guess I wanted to kind of see how you guys have seen the FTC changing, um, I guess, since you started the industry. Like, I know they've just have recently been cracking down more on Instagram and disclosing like this, like they're getting paid for stuff. And how do you feel that when you're talking about these organic things, like, um, if you remember when Catherine Heigl was at Dwayne Reed and Dwayne Reed like posted a picture and they were like, look, Catherine Heigl is shopping at Dwayne Reed and then she sued them for using her likeness. So it's like, what, how do you guys feel about like the disclosure and ads and fashion and stuff? I'm in favor of it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do think, cause it, it just, it's just a little out of control right now, I think, with the whole working with influencers and paying people. And we don't actually pay anybody, but um, it starts to feel like it, it's, you don't know what's paid and what's not paid. And I think that there, there needs to be some regulation, just like advertising, just like advertorial in a, in a magazine. And, and there is regulation. The challenge is there is an enforcement. Um, so there is currently regulation around that. And you saw, saw that example happen with a midtown retailer who I won't name, who grabbed 50 bloggers, put clothing on them, the exact same outfit repetitively, and they were brought to court for it, and they did pay a fine. And, and I think that that was a message to those in the industry that you just need to be um, more forthright. And it's, it's ethically the right thing to do to actually say this is sponsored. And it's, it's not a difficult thing, it's just as sponsored by. And I think actually a lot, of a lot of the more established bloggers will say, all the clothes I wear, I don't get paid to wear them. I buy them. So if I'm wearing something, that's because I chose to wear it as opposed to, you know, XYZ designer paying me to do it. Same with celebrities. Next question, please. Hi, guys. So in fashion, there's a misconception that fashion designers only create clothes for smaller women. How do you guys think that changed over the years? 
How everyone looks at you. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I think it's incredibly important not to pigeonhole women into one size fits all. And I think it's really important to be able to cater to that multiplicity of body sizes. And that's a incredibly important both trend. Um, and I'm fully, fully supportive of it. And we have time for one more question, please. Hi, um, I was just wondering, uh, is it easier to market brand uh, or fashion towards to women than men? And uh, and how did you uh, face any challenges or doubts while developing your brand? I think everybody inevitably is human and has some components of doubt along the particular way. But I think that perseverance, I mean, I can only speak for myself, you know, to drive forward and build a brand um, is, is part of the fortitude that is a requirement to be an entrepreneur. With regards to men's versus women's, you know, um, there are definitely two different types of marketing um, animals, if you would. Um, one much loyal to a fewer brands and one much broader in spending, frankly, more and making the key decisions on the household spending more. So definitely the marketing is different. And do you guys want to add anything? I'm in general uh, not in favor of caricatures. So I think, you know, um, men uh, are increasingly sophisticated about their fashion choices and is witnessed by what's happening in health and in beauty and in grooming. You know, men used to kind of just be mono and are becoming a little more stereo. Um, and I think that that's a good thing. I think that the more sophisticated consumers become across gender, that's better for brands. And it's a I just think sophistication is a, is a good thing in, in humans. Agreed. Well, I've never market. I guess in a way we market to men as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think with Kiki, you for sure market it to men. 30% of our customers are men. So actually, um, it's funny. I, I think it's probably easier to market to women in a weird way, but women have so many people marketing at them that I think... Um, but it's interesting. We love, we love being able to also work with men and helping them navigate a, a woman's kind of world and situation. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here and sharing your insights. Thank you. You've now inspired everyone to go shopping.